So welcome to Firmly Planted Podcast, where we dive into the scriptures for our everyday lives. I'm super excited about our guest here on this episode, as we have Mr. Dr. David Rogers, and we get to uh, uh, just interview him and see what God is doing in his life, but also hear testimony and um, just the legacy that his dad had. Uh, Dr. Adrian Rogers. And so just a brief um, synopsis of who you are, David. Uh, you have grown up in Memphis. You were overseas as a missionary for several years, about 16 years, if that is correct, over in Spain. And then you've been back in the States for some time. Um, you received uh, your MDiv from Southwestern Theological right. Seminary. And then a PhD as well. Uh, Is that correct? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and then you are an elder at Unashamed Church in Memphis, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, a great church plant that is growing and thriving. And then, of course, your your father was Adrian Rogers. So share anything about yourself that you like the audience to hear and know about you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm married to my wife, Kelly. We have we're just celebrating now. My mind's going like, how many years has it been? We were married in '87, so it's been, I think it was 34 years. I think that we just had our anniversary. Have two sons, uh, Jonathan and Stephen, and and Stephen was married a couple years ago. So Shelby is his wife, who's joined our family and we've got another member of the family joey which is our dog he <laughs> may make it <laughs> on the podcast if you hear some barking in the background he's wanting to let his presence be known maybe maybe he'll stay clear <laughs> hey <laughs> dogs are part of the family let's be honest i have two <laughs> of the of the podcast but but uh, right now I'm working with an organization here in Memphis called Christ Community Health Services, which is a Christ-centered uh, series of primary care clinics and uh, pharmacies, dental clinics that we've got um, really spread all around, especially the underserved, more urban areas of Memphis. And we've got another clinic in Jackson, Tennessee, but I serve as a spiritual health advisor, which is the title that we give. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't say chaplains because we, we focus our role a little bit different because it's not really a hospital, but a but a clinic. But I'm there praying with patients, listening to them, counseling them spiritually, and really they give us total green light to share the gospel with people. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit different in some chaplaincy context and so you know, you know every day talking to people a lot of times from all around the world a lot of times from spanish speaking context i'm able to use my spanish you know that i learned mm. on, the, on the mission field in in my current position here as well so that's that's a little bit about what i'm doing right now amen that is awesome and that is such a unique position to have that you can have the freedom to share the gospel like that in that kind of context. So mm -hmm. um, that's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, a few things about your dad, Dr. Adrian Rogers. Um, he was born seven, September 12th, 1931. Is that correct? And uh, um, <laughs> from what I've been told, I wasn't around then to remember, but that's. <laughs> Hey, I totally understand. If you ask me when my dad was born, I may be like, I'm not, I mean, I'm not really sure actually. So I'm not going to test that on me. Yeah, I remember um, there's so, this quote going around on social media from my dad and it says he said it in 1931 in the quote. So somebody got a little mixed up. I don't, I don't think he said it in 1931, but, but yeah, some maybe of somebody that else said it, but not him. Up. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, he passed away November 15th, 2005. And so he was for a long time the senior pastor at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and he was very influential, especially in the 1970s, with the uh, conservative resurgence. And, um, and then he, what a lot of people may not know, I did not know this. I heard something about this, but did not know 
and correct me if I'm wrong, but he was also the chairman of the committee when uh, they produced the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. That's um, yes, that is right. And so I, I, I did not know that. I heard that he was a part of it, and I knew he was a part of it. I did not know he was the chairman. So um, again, a great impact, a wonderful pastor. Um, if you have not listened to many of, of Dr. Rogers' sermons, you just Google Adrian Rogers and you'll find a thousand of them on YouTube. And so, um, so anyway, just give us a brief testimony and just his call to ministry um, that you can recall about your dad. Okay. Yeah, my dad grew up in a home. He was one of four children, actually the uh, third of four children, and his parents were nominally Christian. You know, they'd you know, gone to church here and there and, and say that, you know, they raised their family as a good, moral, upstanding family in the community, but, but didn't really truly know the Lord. Mm -hmm. And a next door neighbor to my dad's family when he was growing up, I, I think my dad was 14 years old at the time, uh, invited his um, father to go to a revival service at the local Baptist church. And my dad's father accepted and brought the whole family along to that revival meeting at the mm. Baptist church, Northwood Baptist church in West Palm Beach, Florida. And at the end, my dad's father was convicted by the preaching of the gospel and walked down the aisle to receive Christ. And as, as you know, my dad told, told it, you know, he walked behind his father and it wasn't just uh you know just well dad's doing it i gotta do it too so he really felt the message and responded you know in faith to the message wow so that was when he made his first um profession of faith i say first profession of faith because he tells and i was just reading over this to kind of prepare for the, for this interview the biography that my mom wrote about mm -hmm. him and and um there's a time two years after that when he said you know, he began to kind of question and doubt his salvation. And, and there was a time when he just went out to an open field and just got down on his knees and said, God, I don't know if I'm truly saved or if I'm not, I'm having these doubts, but I just want to nail it down right now forever that, you know, if I'm not, from now on, I know I am. If I already am, that's fine. You know that that but yeah. that I am yours from this time on and forever, totally committed to you. And, and that's so he he says, even looking back now today, he couldn't tell you for sure, you know, which one when he was 14 years old or when he was 16, but he knows, you know, for sure since that time he has been totally, you know, committed to the Lord. Wow, that's awesome. That that's a lot like my story. I, I've I uh, um, prayed a prayer when I was 12, played, you know, I knew a lot about the Bible growing up, grew up in a nominally Christian home as well. And um, then when I was 21, um, I heard a sermon, 10 marks of a Christian. And I was like, no, 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 no. It was <laughs> desire to witness, desire to um, be in God's word. And I was like, sure, maybe, maybe not. But I realized I'm not hitting half of these and I um, should be. Um, and then I, I didn't get saved then. It was two weeks later. I was working at Chick-fil-A and I got frustrated by something. And um, I went on my break and um, I pulled my Bible I had in my car. And I was like, God, uh, I am not sure if I'm really saved. So basically, long story short, I gave my life to the Lord and surrendered everything then. So I couldn't tell you, maybe I really was saved when I was 12, maybe not. But either way, that day, August 7th, 2012, I know for sure that I was um, then. And so, that's, yeah. That's interesting. I think a lot of us have very similar testimonies. I, I myself have a testimony. Yeah, I'm not going to go into all the details right now, but similar yeah. to that when I made a childhood profession of faith. But you know, it's really, you know, looking back to time when I was about, I think, 13 or 14, where I really mm. nailed it down. Wow. Got my That's awesome. Back. That's awesome. So what about his call to ministry? Just, just briefly, um, because of course, uh, you know, God, God has changed his life. And then, but what about when he really knew that God was calling him to vocational ministry? Uh -huh. 
I mean, he grew up, you know, or say from the time that, you know, he walked down the aisle at Northwood Baptist Church, he joined the, the youth group there at church. And he already was very close with my mom at that time. They had known each other since the fourth grade and were already dating, you know, or began dating, I think, after, after that, that time. And um, so, you know, he was being exposed to ministry and was involved in different leadership areas in the youth group during that period. And then uh, both my mom and he, I think when they were 16 years old, went to a Baptist conference at Ridgecrest there in, in North Carolina, where you said you oh, were wow. from. And there was a, you know, an emphasis on, on call to ministry and if people felt God calling them to ministry and it was during that conference that my dad felt very strongly that you know god was saying that i am calling you to preach and the way he tells it, i think it's really interesting he says you know first of all god if if you're calling me to preach let me know and then the next you know god it seems like you may be calling me to preach you know if, and then finally god if you're not calling me to preach you better let me know for sure that you're not because it sure you know sure seems like that's what i'm understanding wow to say and he would say you know, since that time maybe on two or three occasions he may have doubted his salvation but he said he's never once doubted his call to preach since mm. that time amen amen and um, one of my mentors told me um, several years ago that when God calls you to, to ministry, there is no plan B. It mm -hmm. is God calling you to it and he's going to equip you for it. And um, and then he just gives you that desire. So that, that's amazing. That's awesome to hear about about your dad. Um, so now let's uh, let's look at his impact on the Southern Baptist Convention, because most of his ministry was in the SBC, if I'm correct. And so what, what, what impact from your perspective as his son, from what you have known um, about your dad, what, what impact and influence did he have in the Southern Baptist Convention? Uh, I mean, it goes back, you know, his Southern Baptist roots go back very deep. He was saved, you know, like I say, at Northwood Baptist Church, which was a part of the Southern Baptist Con Convention in, in West Palm Beach. And then he went to a the State Baptist College at that time, which was Stetson University, which since that time has disaffiliated with the Florida Baptist Convention and gone in a much more mm -hmm. liberal direction. But yeah, then he went on to New Orleans Baptist Seminary and got his MDiv, you know, at New Orleans Seminary, and he's always pastored churches that were affiliated with the SBC starting from very small churches with you know maybe 40 50 folks and, and then to his seminary church and then a couple of different churches in Florida until in 1972 I was 12 years old at the time our family moved from um, Florida to Memphis when he accepted the call at Bellevue Baptist okay church, which was kind of a, a legacy, well-known church within the convention. They had already had two pastors at that church before him who had been presidents of the Southern Baptist Convention. Oh, wow. So kind of being at that church and in that pulpit kind of thrust him a little bit more into the kind of the denominational limelight, you know, we, we could say. And he had already kind of gotten a bit of a reputation in Florida, because especially I, I mentioned about Stetson University, and while he was there as a college student, you know, there's some things that were being taught in the religion department that you know, they you know, teaching things like you know, the, there's no such thing as a literal devil. So demon possession in the Bible is really just another way of saying what we would call mental illness today, or you know, what. You know, we know today as um, neo-Orthodox theology was kind of the accepted teaching even back in that day at Stetson University. So he kind of got wind of some of the problems of that and recognized pretty quickly that that didn't really match up with the gospel that his 
pastor, you know, growing up in the youth group had had taught him to believe in various others who had discipled him. And so he had a um, some misgiving, something that just in his heart didn't seem right about that it, and began in, in different ways, you know, to ask questions in the classroom to the professors. And, and there, there was at one time when he was pastoring a church in Merritt Island, Florida. And from what I understand, he, you know, he maybe led the, or led a, a movement among some churches to maybe defund this university from the budget of the Florida Baptist convention. So he'd kind of gotten a reputation as a little bit of a of a renegade and, and making 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 trouble. But you know, those who really loved the authority of the Bible and the word of God had already kind of seen him as a little bit of a hero of standing mm-hmm. up for the authority of God's word. And mm-hmm. so by the time he came to Bellevue, I mean, they called him being aware of that. And that's the type of leadership we're looking for at um, this church. And that was 1972. So it would have been nine year or seven years later. I'm, I'm trying to remember if it was, I think, 79, I think when he was, or 78 or 79, I think when he was first elected president of the Southern Baptist Convention. And that's just, you know, in those seven years or so since he came to Bellevue, various other pastors and denominational leaders had got to know him and really appreciated Mm -hmm. his heart. And several of them challenged him, you know, we think you would be a really good candidate to come and try to turn the direction of the Southern Baptist Convention, because by that time, some of the seminaries even, you know, were going in a direction that seemed to be, you know, if not full-blown liberal, at least were diluting, you know, some of the, of the, the authority of God's word in, in some specific areas. And so, at first, my dad said no. As a matter of fact, it was, I think, 1976, he was first approached and challenged to do this and he just flat out turned it down and says no I don't feel the peace of God that's I don't think that's what he's calling me to do but a couple years later they came back to him and said no I'm not really sure but several different key leaders and friends in his life really kept insisting you know we really think you're God's man for this job would you really pray about it And, and there's a couple key key people. I mean, one was a missionary uh, lady who is a stateswoman on the mission field in China named Bertha Smith, who my dad really looked up to as a spiritual mentor. Who pretty yeah. much a couple that days been before the seven a few times. <laughs> convention kind of sat him down and said, young man, you are, you know, I'm strongly convinced that God is calling you to this position. And and he, you know, through that conversation and various others, he, you know, realized that, you know, well, maybe, maybe indeed God was calling him to that. And so he mm. allowed his name to be presented and he ended up serving as president three different years, three different terms, which is kind of unusual because normally it's just two terms, but he did not allow his name to be put in, um, up for nomination for the second year, which had been kind of the tradition. Usually every yeah. year, someone who served the first year was automatically just elected to the next year. That was just kind of a tradition, but he felt he needed to back off and give more time to his church and family and had some health issues that he was concerned about and declined nomination that second year. But then there's a couple of years after that, that people came back to him and said, well, we really need you to step up again. And so he was elected, you know, a second time. And, and then the third year came from that second year following up that first year as back to the, mm-hmm. to the whole tradition there. Wow. Wow. And during, during some of those presidencies, or at least one, is when he was very impactful with the conservative, or as we know, the conservative resurgence. Um, so what do you recall of, of that and his impact with the, that resurgence? Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, the whole 
dynamic of you know what we've called the conservative resurgence was really underlying everything that led people to come to my father as a sense there was a need to turn the convention around and the entities especially the um, the seminaries and you know, maybe the mission boards to a, to a lower extent i don't think they were quite you know as much of a liberal or what they call moderate direction sure back back then but um you know, the, the thinking was in order to turn all these entities around, there's a system in place and that there's a series of nominations. First of all, the president of the convention nominates a nominating committee, and then the nominating committee nominates trustees of all the different entities. And, you know, they some strategists, shall we say, denominational strategists have put a lot of thought into this is it, to really turn this thing around. It's going to take, you know, several years, five, six, seven years with new trustees coming on these boards of trustees that are going to be able to have the authority to make some decisions related to hiring and firing and laying down some strict doctrinal parameters. And so that was kind of the vision from the beginning was let's, you know, these seminaries that seem to be drifting, you know, more and more in a liberal direction. Can we do something to change that uh, direction? And so my dad was a part of that. And a lot of it was fleshed out through nominations of people who ended up serving on these different, different boards. And maybe a, a big, we, um, big culminating thing was they um, in the year 2000 appointed a committee to look into the Baptist faith and message the Southern Baptist official doctrinal statement and, and some folks thought you know it needed some minor tweaking but there was a few areas that that left a little bit of wiggle room for for some some of this liberal theology that was that was creeping yeah. in said so, you know we need to you know, clarify some of these matters that are left a little bit vague in the in the old wording. So, so my dad was named. This was after he had already served three times as the president of the convention. He was named then as the chairman of the committee that um, studied and proposed the the revision of what was then you know accepted by the whole convention and voted as as their. Baptist Faith and Message, what we call today the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, because that's the most recent revision of our doctrinal statement. Yeah, yeah, and what it, what an impact he had just in that alone. Um, and because I, I, one of those things that you mentioned was the sufficiency and the authority of Scripture was was big in question and just very vague, as you said. And so him being so impactful on the SBC's stance on our authority that's found in scripture. And so um, I know as, as a young pastor, um, he has made an impact in my life in that way. And, and I never met him, never had the privilege, wish I could have one day. Uh, but um, I know for many people, he um, spoke into their lives from millions of miles away. And whether it was through his sermons, through his books, um, through articles that he read or wrote, um, just in numerous ways that your dad impacted people. And so uh, what do you think from, from a son's perspective and from kind of an outside view, what made him so beloved first as, as a pastor and then as a preacher? What, what made mm -hmm. him so beloved by all those people? Yeah, I would say, I mean, the big thing that stands out above everything else is just his personal integrity i mean he was mm. the real thing and what he saw as the public persona was the exact same person you know growing up in the family i mean he lived he, both he and my mom were exemplary in their testimony the way they raised us and he had a deep passionate love for the lord for lost souls, for 
um, the churches he pastored and, you know, for the word of God. So I think, you know, it, a lot of times, you know, people may seem they're all that, but then down the years, things later pop up here and there that shows, you know, there was some hypocrisy maybe there, but there was something about my dad's integrity and authenticity of character that I, I think really that people could see that. Yeah. And, and, and it's just a very convictional leader, but he was able to express those convictions in a very winsome mm -hmm. way, not like an angry way that he was able to gain people's ears in, in ways that lots of more angry approaches have, you know, kind of back backfired. I think that was another big, big um, secret um, of it. Um, as a pastor, um, I think he, he truly loved people, just in mm. individuals. I'm going to give a little bit, one uh, anecdote that I remember. After, like when I was in high school, we would always go as a family after church on Sunday night to the local Mexican restaurant, which was El Chico back in the day here. And my dad loved to take us every Sunday night to uh, El Chico. And, you know, people kind of figured out a lot of times, you know, if you want to see Dr. Rogers, go after, <laughs> go after church <laughs> El Chico and you might get a chance to talk to him personally. But so, you know, we would be there as a family, having our family meal, and inevitably somebody would come up to the table, Dr. Rogers, are you Dr. Rogers and this and that? And you know, to be honest, as, as his child, I always felt a little bit of resentment that these people were kind of invading our family privacy. But at the same time, I was always observing my dad and how he reacted to that situation. And he was always very, very welcoming, very warm and personable with everyone who came up and made yeah. them feel like they were special and they weren't interrupting anything. But then what really you know, made the impression on me is after that person was long gone, never heard a word you know, from my dad complaining, oh, these people keep coming and bothering us. I mean, I could see that that personal warmth he had was not just a veneer that he put it wasn't a facade it was for real. yeah that wow. was who he really was and he really did love and value each of those people who came up and i think that i mean that made a big impact on me as his son growing up and i think that's a big part of the secret why maybe people loved him so much because you can kind mm. of when somebody is that way you can kind of sense that that's the that's the case as well yeah, and his, his messages were always so polished. I mean, you, you rarely find a sermon where he's stumbling over his words or he misses something or, or whatever it may be. Um, but something that I know has always resonated with me washing so far away. Um, I mean, he, he was already passed away when I even began listening to his messages. But mm -hmm. um, is, is that he just felt so personable talking to you from that stage as well. You almost felt like he was just having that conversation with you and that, you know, you have either um, the unpolished message or the polished message that is um, very impersonal, uh -huh. but his was, he was so well balanced on theology and even at times academically, but also the, the spiritual aspect, but then that personal connection um, was just so prevalent within his message. You could just tell um, that he really does care about those he was speaking to. Uh -huh. So that is really cool to hear. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I mean, the Lord gifted him naturally just as a public speaker, something that came natural to yeah. him. For instance, he, you know, even in high school, he was voted most likely to succeed in his senior class. He was the captain of his high school football team. So people early on recognized him. He had some unusual leadership skills. But it yeah. wasn't that alone. It was combined with this sincere love for the Lord. And then he just spent hours and hours and hours just immersing himself in the word of God. Till he you know, came to really master the content of the whole mm. word of God. So, I mean, it was something that he worked at 
very hard and, and kind of, you know, developed his own style of preaching. He's kind of famous for his outlines and alliteration, but alliteration, really, that's it. <laughs> really, really worked hard at, you know, and, and, yeah. but, you know, what he really was wanting to do was communicate God's word to people in a way that would grab their attention and they would be able to understand it and that the, they would leave and be able to remember it. And, and yeah. God really used him that way. Well, one of his books that he wrote on preaching um, it, and he, he made a statement and I've just skimmed through this book before I haven't read the whole thing, but he made a statement that you always need to know your audience. You mm -hmm. always need to know who you're speaking to. Um, and that, that goes to how you dress in front of them all the way to how you interact, what you bring to the stage, what you don't bring to the stage, all of those things. And, um, and again, it just shows that care for who he was talking to. He was willing to do whatever it took for people to draw closer to Jesus. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I love that. I love that about him. Um, yeah, that, that's true. Having been a missionary myself, I mean, that's a great missionary principle, Paul's missionary principle to the Jews I became as a Jew, to, yeah. <laughs> to, to those without the law I became as those without the law, you know, all things to all men in order to win some. And I think my dad latched on yeah. to that principle early, early on. Yeah. Your dad definitely modeled that for sure. Um, I don't have this question in my notes, so that I'm going to throw you a small curveball. Okay. Uh, but I think I think you can handle this. What was his personal devotion life? What, what was it like? What did it look like for him to not be preparing a sermon uh, or a Bible study, but just for him to be personally into the scriptures? Because obviously that had a major role in his mission in his ministry in his life so what did that look like for um for your dad yeah i mean every morning he would get up and have his personal devotional thought he wasn't real outward about it like we didn't you know he didn't have this spot where we'd always see him he was more in his study and it was private for him that part but i know he did it now he always had like his sermon notes for because usually he would have three different sermons during the week sunday morning sunday night and Wednesday night sometimes you know another one he had like a regular bible study that was another sermon and he always had those notes and those, those are always kind of but he would you know make a priority to have a personal time of prayer and mm -hmm. devotional reading but then also uh especially later on but I think you know back from the time I was even in high school I, I remember this that he would always, you know, have a um, kind of devotional time together with my mom where they would read together some type of a devotional thought. There was a period where each day, uh, I remember whenever any of us as children or even when we were a little older, any of the grandchildren were over, he'd always say, let's pick one verse out of the Proverbs. And you're going to pick mm. the proverb, and then we're going to talk about that, what what that means to us. So, I mean, his devotional life, it wasn't just one thing, you know, it was right. faceted. you know, this area, his personal prayer life, his Bible study, you know, to prepare for sermons, his his time together with, with my mother, and then his time sharing you know, Bible thoughts and, and teaching even the, the family at, in the intimate, you know, personal level mm -hmm. as well. That's awesome. That That's amazing. Of course, that personal walk of Jesus is how he was able to do all the things that he did in ministry because um, he couldn't have done it without that. And so um, it definitely showed that he had that walk with the Lord. Um, so we're running out of time, but uh, just... Uh, just a closing idea, closing thought about this. What is your favorite memory of your dad? Can be hilarious, can be funny, can can be very serious. Um, and how, and kind of a, a point two, part two of this question, how is it like to um, have Adrian Rogers as your dad? Mm -hmm. um, and so if that can even be answered in, in a way. And so. All right. Yeah, sure, sure. Now I'm going to share two quick memories yeah, you know, one going back to when I was a small child, because it's just an image of my dad I have. He always had a great sense of humor and just a kind of a playful attitude and was just a very mm -hmm. fun dad. I remember he used to lie down on the ground 
stick his knees up. And when I was like maybe a four-year-old boy, he'd get me to climb up on top of his knees and say, we're going to play the apple tree. And you climb up on the knees. This is, you reach up, there's a big shiny red apple up there. Reach up, reach up. And then all of a sudden I'd reach up and and, and he'd move and I'd fall down. And so little Johnny comes crashing down. It was just a little game. <laughs> And then I've seen him do the same thing with his grandkids since then. And they've always loved him because of that. So that's one memory I have special of him. Another one that comes to mind is after we had been on the mission field in Spain for a number of years, and uh, we were coming back for a furlough and my parents met us in the airport. And at that time, my son had been going through kind of a rebellious stage and he was came in the airport in Memphis, all dressed up in kind of golf type of gear, you know, wearing, um, I think he may have even had earrings in his ears and chains on his pants and all this stuff. But remembering in the air, airport terminal, when, you know, my dad is there to meet us and first seeing my son coming, just my dad totally embracing him. And it's like he, you know, he didn't see any of that it didn't face him back mm. one bit and just the total acceptance of my son and who he was at that at that time was a really special memory um mm. memory as well and your last question is like what is the thing that that really kind of stands out to me um i think you know that as a dad he was able, I mean, he trained us all to love the Lord and know the Lord, but he realized each of his children were unique and were, we would have special pressure put on us. I mean, I felt pressure, you know, like people would ask me, are you going to be a preacher just like your dad when you grew up? And I think my dad, both my parents were aware of that pressure and they did everything they could to kind of lift that pressure and to make us feel accepted the way God had uniquely made us. Now I went on mm -hmm. into ministry, but I kind of fought that thing, you know, about being a preacher, just like my dad for a long time. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for, you know, the way my dad was able to handle that and, and that I was able to really feel his total blessing and approval, no matter which way the Lord led me, that, that's something that really stands out to me about him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Well, anything else in closing uh, before we wrap up that you just want people to know about your dad? Um, and I, I think we've covered a lot of who he was and his impact, but anything just as his son, again, th this is to honor his legacy. This is to, um, you, you made the statement that um, he was a person of integrity and and it seems like as time goes on, whether because of social media or whatever it may be, um, people's integrity is often in question and sometimes comes to fruition. You see who they really were. And obviously your dad was who he really was. And so that's the purpose of this is to just honor him for who he was, what God had done in his life. Um, and so anything else that you would like to share about your dad? Yeah, I'll share one last word. Just this past Monday, we were remembering, celebrating the 16th anniversary of his death. And since, you know, 19 or 2005, when he died, lots of water has gone under the bridge. Lots of things have happened in our country, in our world, even in the Southern Baptist Convention and things, you know, I think would really break my dad's yeah. heart. Yeah. And um, lots of division in the body of Christ. And yeah. I think that is a big thing that would break my dad's uh, heart to see the division and even between good Bible believing people who maybe one group has a little bit of a nuance in one area and the other. I mean, he's known as being a fierce defender of the authority of the word of God and that he was, but he was also a very big hearted man who had a vision for the unity of the body of Christ and, and I especially you know I want him to be remembered as that not just as this you know crusader for yeah you know, the, the just his vision and and I think you know that his heart would be broken about a lot of the disunity going on nowadays 
Yeah, I, I agree. Like I said, I never got to know your dad in a personal way, but I, I would agree that I think his heart, as mine is as well, will be broken over what we're seeing within the convention um, and within a lot of churches uh, today. And, and so, um, and who knows how your dad would handle it now. Um, I'm sure he would have some wise words to say. And at times I wish we had um, Mr. Rogers, Dr. Rogers to uh, ask questions and to have that influence and then gather that unity because you're right. There is a lot of disunity. And so, um, but God always leaves a remnant. God always um, has a person that he uses. And so um, who knows um, who, who and how God can do and change things. Um, and so, but thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for spending your time. Um, if you were to stay after just one moment uh, um, after we end. And, uh, and so thank you so much for listening today. If you have not subscribed to Friendly Planted Podcast, please do that. Give us a thumbs up, give us five stars, give your comments and share it with your friends. And we'll see you next time.